I'm Charlie Riley. I'm the director of the Nassau Museum of Art. Thanks for coming today. You know what's hot? And I mean really hot, the art market. The art market has been soaring. It didn't matter what happened this past year. People are buying, people are investing, people are collecting. I'm here to invite you to think about how you get into this incredible game. I mean, you, if you thought real estate was soaring, the art market is on a tear. It's the, most, it's the biggest bull market I've ever seen in a long, long time. But let me also add to that, because I've covered this since whew, a long, long time ago as a business reporter for Fortune, and I ran a magazine called Art and Auction. This market, like a lot of unregulated markets, is full of risks. There are frauds and fakes. There are unscrupulous dealers, unscrupulous auction houses. There are all kinds of ways to get gypped in a market this hot, especially for those who just don't know it. At the museum, we'd like to use this moment to sort of educate some of our friends and educate some people who would like to help us out because we're about to open the first time ever a, a big auction of some works that are actually coming from the collection of the museum and then a few that are coming from wonderful great internationally renowned artists who are such dear friends of this museum that i'm almost getting choked up thinking about how generous they were when we said that for the first time because of the pandemic actually the museum association that governs all of us said we're relaxing the usual rules, the ethical rules that govern the deaccessioning of work from a permanent collection to help museums with their, with their budgetary problems. Now, the way in which to do this, because I've actually written about this and I was once very much against it. So I have very funny feelings about this auction just as an ethical thing. You're not supposed to just sell something and then you know, pay some administrator <clears throat> um, too much money. You're supposed to, if you sell something, if you're a museum, you're supposed to be acquiring something or taking care of the art. And for me, that means the art that's in the building, but also the sculpture that's outside. So becoming a part of this, becoming an investor, a collector, helping us out with this, means you'll be helping us out with something that we're rather proud of at this point. I mean, right behind me is one of the great shows that we've ever had, the Andy Warhol Show. We're on a tear also. We're on a bull market at this museum. We're trying to do more and more important things, with, especially with contemporary art. So this auction is meant to sustain and to build that momentum, which we're really feeling actually. Thousands of people have been coming to this show. We just want to give them another great show and another great show and another one and a little bit of a budget for exhibitions, for curatorial fees and curatorial expenses. The curators are those who take care of the art in the museum and also those who put it on the wall. That's what this is all about. There are 100, 100 amazing works of art, and many of them are by some of the most renowned artists in the world. I, I almost can't believe what we've got in this auction. And as a matter of fact, people have been sort of knocking on the door already saying, can I get a piece of this before we open the bidding on September 1st? And we close the bidding, gotta pay attention. We close the bidding on September 17th at 7.30 p.m. And that's it. And if you thought you were gonna get this one or that one at a bargain, you, if, if you snooze, you lose on something like this, which is an online bidding process. It's gonna help the museum tremendously because we don't even have to pay a fee. It's so great that everybody's pitched in on this auction. Um, I got clearance to sell some of the works for the collection. I got these wonderful donations from some of my best friends who are artists. And it's all to help us get through this budgetary crisis. So let's take a look, shall we, at some of the highlights of the auction. I think you're gonna, if you know these names, I won't be surprised if you know the name Salvador Dali, right? Or if you know the name, for instance, Jeff Koons. If you know these names, I think you're gonna be wonderfully impressed. I told you the art market was hot, but you wanna see something really, really cool? 
<laughs> this is the blue dog of Jeff Koons. This is an icon of contemporary American art. Nobody is ruling the auction houses like Jeff Koons. He, you think Andy Warhol's hot stuff? Jeff Koons is amazing. I've known Koons since 1981, right? When he had just been, actually, a Wall Street commodities broker. He knew, he understood how markets work. He understood how art and money go together. And then he took off on this amazing terror. Every time I see Koons now, I think, you planned this really brilliantly, you know that? Because he found a way, for instance, in those days, he would take a vacuum cleaner, literally from Sears, put it in a box and sell it for $10,000 as a sculpture. He's picking up on a great idea that Marcel Duchamp already had, which was take a urinal, sell it as a sculpture. It's kind of, it's kind of the artist as consummate wise guy. But then, Coons became, in terms of monumental outdoor sculpture, with a huge puppy covered in flowers, Coons suddenly became the most sought after artist when it came to either public art or the trophy collections of hedge funds managers all over Greenwich, Connecticut. This is an opportunity for you to join their ranks. And when I say there is no, if this were Wall Street, right, this would be like buying shares of Apple <laughs> or buying shares in the old days of GE or IBM. This is, this is the blue chip. And Jeff Koons, it, it really, it doesn't get any bigger than this. And I happen to think that this is probably going to be one of those, probably the most sought after piece of contemporary art in the whole sale. It's amazing just to have it, right? Everybody loves the balloon, balloon dogs, by the way. It's interesting. I'm standing in front of Andy Warhol, and I remember what was so fun about Warhol was that Warhol, you know, could just sort of make you smile. And Koons makes you smile. And as a matter of fact, every time I see Jeff Koons, and this goes back to 1981, he had that smile on his face too, which is, of course, the smile of the artist laughing all the way to the bank. I really think that when we put these works on view, September 7th at the Manus Center here at the museum, this is probably one of the pieces that you're gonna to want to pay very, very close attention to. So I'm allowed a couple of favorites, right? And boy, this is one of my personal favorites, maybe because I've known this artist for such a long time, Ben Shonsai. And in the world of photorealism, I think he, he and Richard Estes, but he's just about the greatest that you can have. Probably 20 times his masterpieces have been on these walls of this museum in the 30 year history of the museum. This is really, really a major artist. He's known in Germany, he's known in Asia, he's known all across the United States. I can't believe he was kind enough to give us this little masterpiece with a wonderful surrealist side to it. Getting you ready to think about Salvador Dali as well. Ben can do anything as an artist. He can do tight photorealism. He could do brushy and drippy, like something like that. He can bring you in close to a little figure like this, which is an amalgam of something that is not alive and something that is alive. You see the lovely, <laughs> it's the ears and the palette of the face of this figure. They're almost like two figures on a stage. His mom, by the way, was a singer. I've always found something very cinematographic about Ben Shonsai. Something as though he's doing a scene from a movie, a scene from a play, especially the way in which he lights it. This one is called Spotlight. And man, it is a gem. And it is a great opportunity to own your own Ben Shonsai. This guy at a gallery is wickedly expensive. So it's really amazing that we've actually got this painting here in the auction. Barbara Prey, who is the greatest watercolorist in the world right now? 
And it's always been a toss up among a number of different American names. Way back, it would be Winslow Homer. Barbara Prey internationally is probably better known than any other artist in this auction. She's a major part of the Art in the Embassies program, which means that her art hangs all over the world in American embassies. She did, I'm not making this up, the White House Christmas card. Her watercolors, I just saw one in a gallery in the Hamptons going for $225,000. This is a major, major artist. She's well known all across the Eastern Seaboard because she's the star of a gallery up in Port Clyde, Maine, which is, you know, Winslow Homer territory, right? She happens to be a resident of Oyster Bay. A, she grew up here near us in Manhasset. And I have known her for years. I've written a couple of books about her. I am amazed that we have such a magnificent work by Barbara Prey in this auction. How kind of this woman to take, to just to, to give us this and to allow us to sell it to benefit the museum, to benefit our curatorial program. She is the only woman right now on the panel of the National Endowment for the Arts. I mean, this is a major, major artist. One of the loveliest things about this auction is that you're not only going to support your local museum, which is trying very hard to become an international sensation, no, but you're also supporting local artists. It's amazing how many local artists stepped up to our call to donate work. And this is by Raul Conti. It's called Majo el Timbo. I think it's a kiss. I think it's very romantic, actually. Reminds me a little bit of Constantine Brancourt and that wonderful kiss, those two kissing figures that he engraved in stone locked together. It has marvelous color. It has an amazing formal composition and structure. The symmetry of it, it's Adam and Eve in a way, but in a beautifully modernist vein. It sort of straddles that wonderful hybrid territory that many art historians love between abstraction and realism. And boy, are we lucky just to have the opportunity to see it here at the museum. Hey, how about a bit of power? on your wall, how about some color on your wall? This kind of abstraction just completely commands a room. Barbara Bilotta is the artist, another wonderful local artist, actually. I love this medium. It uses the resin on top of acrylic so that the colors, it's sort of like glazing something. It's sort of like putting glass, actually, over a watercolor. The colors all start to pop. This fantastic blue, for instance, the lovely, lovely luminous yellow that's in the center of this thing. And it's once it's sort of, it feels like it's submerged in this aqueous solution. And you're seeing it from above or from the top of a, the surface of a pool or the surface of a pond or a lake. It's really, really one of the most dynamic and powerful canvases in the entire ex exhibition, I should say, or entire sale, partly because of its scale, you know. Power in art, where does it come from? Sometimes it comes from scale. Sometimes it comes from color, the impact. Andy Warhol was the famous one for that. And sometimes it just comes from the type of composition. This thing just sort of surrounds you. Barbara Bellotta is the artist. And now for a little art history. There was a time when if you took a spray can 
and tagged, for instance, I mean, spray painted graffiti on, for instance, the MTA subway cars or somebody's nice wall or gallery walls down in Soho, you got arrested. <laughs> but then came a whole generation in the 1980s, and I happen to have been around when this happened, of really superstar graffiti artists, street artists. So we've got this extremely talented young artist in Glen Cove, which is right out over there through the window I'm looking at. And his name is nicknamed, because they all have a nom de plume, right? A nom de guerre. <laughs> and his nickname is Fetus, P-H-E-T-U-S, please. And he gave us this huge thing, which is so full of life. It's exactly like what he might have done on the side of a brick wall building, right? But it's there and it's on canvas. And you could take this, you could bring this right into your home, I guess, or into your office. And then what an impact this would have on anybody who walked into that room or into that gallery. This is this, is this fascinating story that's still playing out, which is how these artists went from the street into the gallery, into the museums, and became a part of our, of our lives in the so-called high art world. And I love this, by the way. It's exactly what Andy Warhol would have understood in a second. Andy Warhol being one of Jean-Michel Basquiat's mentors, right? Which is, it, it starts with what many people might call low, right? A, a Campbell's soup can, something low, advertising, right? Or the, the layout of a magazine, something low, something fairly common, something a little bit, um, you know, not worthy of a museum wall. And then it rises to the status of the work of art. And Fetus has given us, truly, it, people walk into my office and say, ah, oh, that is extraordinary. Every great exhibition, every great auction should have some wonderful large format color photography. And this is just a phenomenal work by a, a wonderful guy. His name is Jim Sabaston. And Sab, as what I call him, Sab has really, really made a name for himself in the photography circles of Long Island. He's one of the most beloved figures, actually. But he's also a real experimenter with techniques, with color, with the ways of printing it. This is an image actually of Old Westbury Gardens, which is one of my rivals. <laughs> Sorry, that slipped out, right? But it's a wonderful image of a very, very important place in this neighborhood, Old Westbury Gardens. I think he's a brilliant thinker and photographer. He's not just recording the scene. He's capturing, in almost in an elegiac way, what makes it meaningful and beautiful. And then the greatest thing about this piece is it almost has a patina. I like art that is not just of this moment, but forever. And, and Sab in this one has been able to sort of give you the sense of the timeless. Now, Old Westbury Gardens, just like my mansion and my gardens, these are gilded age houses. These are gilded age estates. So they're already sort of knocking on the door of history. But how do you make that last? How do you make that uh, work for all time? And this is one of the great things I think about why art has embraced color photography just in the past 30 years or so. People like Cindy Sherman and Thomas Struth, all of us realize that the way in which these things are printed is almost like the way in which things are painted. And this is an absolutely exquisite work by Jim Sabaston. As you can see, it's very large too. It'll, it'll, it'll make a huge statement on your wall. There are two great pleasures in something like this auction. One is just the fun of toying with a small sculpture. It's really what we call a maquette, M-A-Q-U-E-T-T-E, -E, a maquette for a larger sculpture. It was made by a brilliant artist named Richard Heinrich, famous in the city especially. We're about to install two of his monumental works. This is a maquette, this is a little, study for something that could go 
20 feet high, right? The other, because if you have it, if you own it, if, you, if it's yours, you get to play with it. Isn't that fun? The other great pleasure, I think, is when you're looking at a study like this, a maquette, and you're turning it and twisting it and playing with the different angles, which by the way, he told me, actually his wife also said, play with it, just, just turn it a few times and see how it rests for you. You're also, you're getting into the mind of the artist because it's almost like looking at somebody's drawing or looking at someone's manuscript or listening to a composer at the keyboard as he's working through the tonal harmonies of one of the compositions he's still working on. And he's got, he said, ah, it's not quite right yet. I'll know it's when it's right, but I got to noodle with it. it musicians I know call it noodling. Architects and sculptors and people who design work in three dimensions. This is just a twisted piece of, of iron with other twisted pieces of iron that he is a really, really good welder, has welded on in this kind of strangely biomorphic form. It's stamped by the artist Richard Heinrich. Shale is the title, 1970. Excuse me, Shale 72 is the title, 1995 is the date. So it's stamped and that's his way of signing it, the way artists will sign the work, usually in the lower right corner or the lower left corner. But that's not what fascinates me about this. It's a, you could almost feel the thinking process as he gives this a little twist and he gives that a little twist and he says, I'm gonna do this, it's gonna be somewhat symmetrical, but then this one's gonna be bent this way. Because symmetry, symmetry in this would be incredibly boring. So this is Richard Heinrich's work. We're going to feature him when we install two of his monumental sculptures. I was at a studio visit with him. Kindly, kindly, he said, what would you like for your auction? What would, what, what would appeal to you? And I said, I want something, Richard, that has your hand in it. I want something that shows me, showing you also, shows me the how you think, how you work. we lucky to have a Hunt Slonim in this. He's a darling of American society, especially Manhattan society. You see him all over the gossip pages. You see him all over the glossy magazines. A bold-faced name. Also, if you're accustomed to dining out in Manhattan, you've seen his work on the walls of many, many restaurants. Hunt Slonim has this huge studio in Brooklyn. Every day, he starts the day with a kind of finger exercise, which is to draw a rabbit. So here is Hop, a little bunny, in a very, very interesting frame. I once asked him about his frames. He said, these are 19th century or early 20th century photographic frames. And having a hunt slonum, I go into mm, Wall Street people's offices, beautiful homes here on the North Shore in Lucas Valley. There's a hunt slonum. There's another hunt slonum. I sometimes feel as though hunt slonum painted more bunnies than, than God himself has created, but they're everywhere and everybody loves them. We were very, very fortunate that hunt slonum who's been in a couple of the exhibitions lately in this, ex in this museum, Hans Lonham gave us this wonderful painting to help us out. And you too can have a Hans Lonham in your home, like many of the great bold-faced names of Manhattan. surprised when we found in our vaults two really wonderful pieces by two of the most fascinating artists of Japan today. And it's kind of funny that I'm standing in front of Andy Warhol because one of them, Takashi Murakami, is considered to be the Warhol of Japan. He's a brilliant, brilliant colorist like Warhol. He's a very, very great printmaker. The work we have is a small sculpture, very, very charming. Everybody likes Murakami, whether in Japan or abroad. It's one of the tests, right, of a great pop artist is how far the work can travel and still have a kind of universal appeal that's very, very cheerful. He calls his style super flat. 
And I've always wondered about ex exactly what he meant by that. It's a reference to the flatness of many abstract canvases, but it's also his way of saying, I'm Murakami and my work is super flat. And this is a really, really quintessential version of what Murakami is best known for, which is something uh, like Kunz, right? Something very cheerful, something very colorful, uh, something that brings you back to your childhood. Together with Murakami, we have Nara. And Nara, another figure, by the way, that's in our collection that we're putting into the auction. And Nara, like Murakami, has this amazing appeal right now. He's got this huge show in Los Angeles that has attracted hundreds of thousands of visitors. It's amazing how big this show has been. And Nara burst on the scene, I think just after Murakami, if I'm not mistaken. I don't, I don't know my chronology as well as I should with Japanese artists. And just like Murakami, but also has a darker side. A little bit like what a good surrealist does, which is sort of enchant you, uh, delight you, you know, seduce you with something that's cute and childlike, but then there's a slight edge to it. So between Nara and Murakami, I think we have two of the great masters of pop as pop was translated into Japanese. And now for the drum roll, now for the white gloves, now for the moment you might have been waiting for all along. We couldn't believe our luck when one of our best, best, best friends here at the museum walked in with Salvador Dali, a portfolio, the whole portfolio in immaculate condition, still in its wooden box, still in its satin lined presentation case. This is amazing. You, I mean, one of these on the wall would be an occasion. The whole portfolio completely the way it was the, the day he did it. Are you kidding me? This is amazing. And this, by the way, I should add is not every Dali on the market is a Dali, if you know what I mean. It's kind of notorious how many fakes there are out, out there. This came from the hands of the artist to the collector and from the hands of the collector just a couple of weeks ago now to us. And when we received it, when we first went through it, it was like this extraordinary revelation. We knew that we had something, not just precious, but close to a masterpiece on our hands. And how exciting for those of you who will get to see this intact. You know, a portfolio like this, kind of like the portfolios behind me. There's something about this. It's the way in which Dolly intended it to be experienced. So I hope you enjoy this as much as I'm about to enjoy this because this is truly the way in which a great artist, one of the great artists of the 20th century, a master of surrealism, Dali and Picasso, right? Dali and Picasso, right up there at the top of the game of surrealism. Still to this day, when you mention the name Dali, even to somebody who doesn't know very much about art at all, oh, I love Dolly. I think he's amazing. He makes me dream. He makes me think. He makes me excited. This is just one of the most exciting moments, really, in this whole auction. So let's take a look inside. This is the cover. And now I'm going to open the slipcase. And as you see, it's still in its original wooden case, which I think is amazing as well. That's because it's basically from the artist himself. Aaliyah, 25 lithographs, based on original gouache is nothing better to reproduce a gouache because a gouache is a painting, as you probably already know. It's, a, it's an opaque watercolor than the printed medium of the lithograph. It's so true to the painterly side and to the colors of the, of the original gouache. I wanted to show you this, though, before we get too far into it, which is this sort of explains the portfolio itself. As you can see here, this is copy number 49 out of an edition of 250. There was another group of 25 copies that were initialed A to Y, and then there are 250 copies 
each one signed and in a second you're gonna see it. And that's the essential thing. You gotta see that Dolly signature in pencil on every single one of the lithographs. You Otherwise, mm -mm -mm, you're back into that territory, of that highly risk risky territory of fake Dolly. So here we are, copy number 49 of 250. When I first opened it, by the way, because I love prints, I mean, these are prints behind me too, these Warhols, I was quite fascinated that though the edition was made in New York on the 20th anniversary of the birth of the State of Israel, this is what the text, including a, a prefatory letter from David Ben-Gurion is all about, some of the works were printed in Paris and some of them were printed in Zurich, in Switzerland. And there's kind of an interesting play between the two, the type of art, the type of color, the type of printing process between the two. And then of course it's, it's copyright 1968 by a New York-based publisher called Shorewood. The first part of it is a long text. There's a prefatory letter from David Ben-Gurion, who's also pictured in the, in the portfolio, and this is his this is sort of his uh, letter saying what the occasion of this is, which is the anniversary of the State of Israel. Then there is an immensely learned and really, really very well written essay by a Columbia University historian, Gerson Cohen, on the founding of the State of Israel. And all of this sort of is a self-contained historical text. And Dolly, it doesn't mention Dolly, it doesn't talk about the art historical premise of all this, it doesn't say anything really about the ways in which Dolly, shall we say, illustrated this, but in a moment you're gonna see that this is quintessential Dolly. He just, he takes it in his own direction. He was given the commission, and then he, there is a very, very, very good um, a, a portrait of David Ben-Gurion, but other than that, it's quintessential Dolly from then on. So this is the text and it goes for about 29 pages or so. I'll turn them slowly. You have to handle a work of this value and of this, basically this con in this condition, very, very, very carefully, 24 pages. Here we go, and now here we go. This is the small catalog of all the lithographs. Oh boy, I can't wait. I can't wait to see what we're about to see. And this gives you a sense of the order right, in which they go. This gives you also the titles, which are not on the works. And it also, and I think this is fantastic, right? It gives you the biblical quote from Psalms, for instance, from Deuteronomy at one point, from Jeremiah at one point. They, these are some of the biblical passages that are cited that, that gave Dolly, in a sense, his titles. So in a way, oh man, this goes together with another very, very famous moment in modern art, which was Marc Chagall's illustrated portfolio for the Bible. But most of these texts are gonna be very, very, very familiar to your readers. So are we ready? Here we go. First plate. First plate. 49 out of 250, signed by Salvador Dali in pencil. Why pencil, Charlie? That's the, that's the convention, that's the tradition in prints that you sign on the page just outside where the plate is in pencil. Very, very, very important part of the, what we would call the authenticity, the provenance of this work. One of the great things about our auction, if I can just boast for a second, is like provenance is tricky. Many auction houses will have a work that has kind of like a sketchy provenance. Provenance means the artist made it, who owned it, what gallery sold it, what gallery sold it again, what auction house had it, what collector had it, and most important, very often, because I've actually seen this getting really, really weird, weird, who just had it before, who just had this work before it came to the museum, who just had this work before it came to the auction house. Unbelievably difficult when provenance has gaps. You know, where was this thing? The provenance in this particular case is immaculate. It came from the artist to the collector, to a museum, and a museum as provenance, in fact, it's one of the important parts of the auction, right, is the works that we're selling from our own collection as well have an immaculate provenance. Where were they? They were at the museum, taken care of, beautiful humidity and temperature controls, but also the record keeping, 
When were they shown on the walls? When were they loaned out? Um, who, you know, basically they've been in our collection, but what is their history? That's what we call provenance. And authentication is, is the most important part of it. It's a very important part of the value. Let's take a look at some of these, shall we? You'll see a variety of styles in the way in which Salvador Dali addressed this work. For instance, something very, very different from what you just saw is this with the silhouette. And all this wonderful dripping makes me think of a great San Francis painting here. Um, a very, very, very dark work here. Uh, a, a mother actually lamenting the death of one of her children. I don't have to teach you the history of Israel. I don't have to teach you uh, the, this history in the 20th century. Dali, who was Catholic, this is kind of an interesting there's a kind of frisson here between the Catholic Spanish artist and this, and this subject matter, which in the preface is referred to as a Zionist story. This one is one of my favorites. It is a very strange work. Well, that's Dolly, right? This is from Psalms, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Figures here, tiny little figures here, just typical Dolly, so delicately drawn. He was an amazing draftsman. But then here, what is going on here? It seems very abstract until all of a sudden, I'll let you look, I'll let you look, now I'll help you. Two eyes, some teeth, a jaw, a skull. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Now, an exquisite example of the draftsmanship that made the surrealist such a great realist. That face, amazing, that face. And that face, this also has to do with lamentations if I'm not mistaken. These blues, if you <laughs> really remind me more of Chagall. And when this came in, we thought, ah, oh, Chagall Dali, Chagall Dali, two, two great artists of the same period, two great rivals, if you will. And I find it fascinating to go through this portfolio and see Dali sometimes even adopting some of the stylistic ideas of Chagall, including the gold in this, this you will recognize instantly as the Wailing Wall. And very, very bright, beautiful colors. Why is it in such great condition? It's been in this box for so long. It's, been, it's had a piece of paper over it. The condition of this couldn't be better in many ways. And in addition to provenance, condition. What are the two things that could affect the value of a great work of art? I like this one, because this has got that thing that Dolly does so well, which is, here's that little bee. Here's this mountain range back here, which is near Barcelona. It's, you see it in a lot of Dolly paintings. It's sometimes way in the distance. And the famous one, Persistence of Memory, with the melting clocks, you see that range. And of course, what he's doing is he's relating his own home territory in Spain to Israel and to the Middle East. I find, one of the anomalies I find in this one, if I may, because you read these things iconographically, you read them for what's going on in this. What is he doing walking into the picture? I feel like I'm in a Monty Python skit. That's, the, uh, that's almost like a Catholic archbishop walking into this picture that has to do with the state of Israel. It's quite, but that's Dali, right? I mean, that's what surrealism was also about, these very strange conjunctions the things that happen to you in a dream, but that aren't supposed to happen either. It's a very, very strong and beautifully printed work. Oh, look at the music in this one, which is the, uh, one part of the melody of the, of the Israeli national anthem. I should have pointed out each time, 49 out of 250. There's the signature, and then here's the signature again, but this was on the plate. He, he signed the plate. And really, really fascinating. You'll see this a couple of times in these plates. This incredible white, like almost like a bone white. And she looks as though she's dancing on, on, on point. I like the graphic punch of these notes, the notes of the, of the melody. And now something very, very different, actually. Uh, something much more exuberant. I was puzzled by this one a little bit about the sort of cuff on her arm and the ways in which she's emerging from the background. And some of these have to do with the tempestuous beginnings of the state of Israel. Now we're sort of 
moving from the biblical side of this to the historical side, I like this one because I kind of love the way Dolly in his surrealism uh, uses eroticism. I think it's, this is a, an amazing figure. Uh, that's one of the reasons uh, that Dolly has captivated audiences for such a long time is that he's capable of doing a figure just like that with such ease. He, Picasso, uh, if you want, I also think of Magritte when I look at this. But now look, you've had a moment to look carefully. Uh-oh. You see, the soldiers are entering the city. I mean, this has always been one of the great themes in art, right? Eros, love and Thanatos, death, love, and death in one simultaneous image. Probably artistically one of the most interesting moments in the whole portfolio. Oh, ho, ho. speaking of figural drawings, speaking of draftsmanship, speaking of the, what made Dolly Dolly, take a look at this, the musculature, the way in which these figures are done, then these lighter figures in the background, but man, con concentrate on that, that is just fantastically. Uh, rendered. This is a this is somebody who goes to life class and just blows everybody else away. Who does this remind you of or me of? Michelangelo. And also a man named William Blake, a fantastic English artist, but Michelangelo, man. The Last Judgment? Are you kidding me? That's exactly what's going on here. This is the arrival of the ship on the coast uh, bearing the uh, refugees from Europe. A wonderful moment of color here. And then pay attention, or I did, I started to pay attention to these ladders that reach out. And these lovely figures down at the bottom on the shore. I thought that part was fascinating. He just let those colors, in a way, melt. He let them flow. This one, I'm going to just keep my voice down, because this is deep. This is, this is just completely tragic. Barbed wire. And these figures and the way in which he used almost a bone white for the figures. Probably the deepest, saddest part of the whole portfolio. And I told you to watch for that ladder. Here it is again, another battle scene. I don't have to teach you the significance of the red and something like this, but here comes the sort of the, another paradox that Dali has able to do, which is he's able to make beauty out of war. He's able to make a beautiful composition out of a dreadful moment in history. And from this, the jubilation, although it's dark, but this is in song. This is, this is the jubilation, the consolation. The, this, is, this is now the founding. And that's why one of the historic parts of this here is Ben-Gurion. And I've seen the photographs and the, and the news photographs of this moment when he proclaimed the state of Israel. So this is drawn from a, you know, a real moment, the microphone, uh, the, the cameras of the press that, that are right there. Anyone who's familiar with the, with the history will recognize this image as, it's, it's almost like the, I think that Dolly was thinking also of George Washington, like the George Washington of the state of Israel. Now we get into a whole, a whole other group of images that have to do with that moment after the founding of the State of Israel. And it's quite, it's quite almost as though Dali took off and, and did his own thing. Because, for instance, look at this beautiful diagonal. Take your time. This feels abstract and very geometrical. But all of a sudden, ah, there's the angel's wing. There's that upturned chin. There's the profile. And here, 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 almost like a Leonardo drawing is a, a face. And now it's Dali taking off in the different styles in which he was famous for. This actually reminds me a little bit of the great Spanish artist, also Catalan. His name was Juan Miro. I, 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 when I looked at this one, I thought, oh, that feels like a Miro. I, sometimes it feels like Chagall, sometimes Miro. And here too, this is where Dali sort of lets those ink spin off from it. The horses, of course, are there. And you can see the gesture. But I love the scratchy part of this. And almost you could see Dali in his signature echoing some of the action, some of the, the vigor of this, the energy of this. It's such, it's, it, it's, it's such a tour de force, this whole portfolio. It's, it's amazing to see Dali showing off all the different tools in his toolbox. Uh, his use of color, his use of the figure, his use of random dots of ink as well. He wants, when he wants to, he could be a super realist, 
For instance, look at this. Whoa. This on the wall would be an immensely powerful portrait. This, and it, if I'm not mistaken, this also is from either the book of Lamentations or from Esther. There's a, there's a sadness to this, and yet there's a, this, this magnificent power to it. He just floats that head right out into the center of the page. Probably one of the best uses of the portrait genre that you'll ever see in Dali. This one fascinated me. It has to do with the bringing of water to the, to the farms and to the fields. I've always enjoyed looking at these tiny little figures. It's endlessly fascinating to look at a dolly that has these figures in it. And then you've got this very, very vigorous di di diagonal. And from this and then this up here, which is another angel in many ways. And ha 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 ha, I just noticed it. There's that line of the mountains and the hills that repeats quite often in this. And from that water, the garden and the colors that make it as the desert blooms, the grapes, for instance. And this, I think, you know, this is Dali saying, you've seen the tragic side of this. Now I'm going to give you a little bit more exuberance. It's, the, it's the, another moment when I thought of Chagall, actually, when I looked at it. But not this, not where Dali does these tiny little figures. That's pure Dali. And beautiful gestures as well. That's, that's what makes this portfolio so fascinating. Here are the fishermen. And I was talking about Michelangelo before and the way in which he does the figures and the muscles in the figures. Look at that. And then all of a sudden I took a look at this part and I thought, ah, Matisse. It feels so much like Henri Matisse, the way in which Matisse would use the, the, fron the fronds and the leaves. A marvelous, marvelous figural study in here. Look at this one. The land of milk and honey. Milk and honey or honey and milk. I love the, the arrows of it again, but this fascinates me. He just poured the ink, the, pa the paint. He just poured the paint and let it go. There's that ridge that I so enjoy in some of these. He's pushed it down to the bottom of the page. Look at the way the figures are drawn. She's dancing like that. Really, really amazing composition. And he's given this cloud a kind of colorful halo, almost like a rainbow is going to come out of it. The symbolism of this, I don't need to teach you. Look though at what Dali does with it, making a dance around the base of it, and then giving you this sort of semi-abstract sky where he lets the color seep into the water. This is called wet on wet. This is when an artist allows the paint just to spread almost <laughs> as it wants to with a kind of liberty instead of um, controlling it. You just say, go, 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 go. And this is the circumcision image. Uh, quite an interesting shift now in terms of the palette of this, although you do still get these fantastic blues and reds. I don't need to teach you what the, that red is all about. And I, I really kind of find this almost like a chorus of onlookers watching. Uh, of course, here, look how well Dali does the calligraphy with this. And here, here's the scholar, right? A beautiful, beautiful pen. Uh, it's the second great portrait study in the, in the portfolio. What, um, another powerful moment, 49 out of 250. And as I was saying, you can almost feel the, the way in which he's changed w from one style to another. And that, my dear friends, is Salvador Dali's Alia, a masterpiece. So you want to be a part of all of this? You want to be in the red hot art market? Don't forget these two dates. September 1st, you can register and start bidding online. And man, that's a great time to start you know, getting some bargains. September 17th though, <laughs> check your bid because at 7.30 p.m., pay attention, at 7.30 p.m. on September 17th, all of this closes down and we start handing you the art hopefully, that you're going to love, that you're going to enjoy, and that maybe one day is going to be worth thousands and thousands of dollars or millions of dollars for your grandchildren. <laughs>